Welcome back to migrating a .NET Framework WPF app to .NET Core 3. In this second video, we're going to actually start the migration now that we've done the preparatory work. We're going to create a new CS proj, make sure that we have updated versions of our NuGet packages, uh, so that we'll be all set up for video 3 where we actually start making code changes. So uh, again, I see migration as a four-step process where you sort of prepare, you get the project file set up, and adjust NuGet packages and other third-party dependency references, then a fourth step where you fix the code, and then you run, and you test, and you find any runtime differences, and you account for those. So we're on step two now. Now, one of the first things we have to think about when we're setting up our new CS project file is where does this project file live? That might not seem on the surface like a very interesting decision, but it actually is because it's going to... Uh, no matter what answer we give to that question, we're going to have some challenges. Now, the first option, and the one that I would recommend starting, you know, maybe six months from now or whatever, .NET Core 3 is in a state that you can go live on it, would be to just replace the old project file. You could imagine uh, getting rid of the old project file, putting a new one in its place, and if you want to target both .NET Framework and .NET Core, you can use multi-targeting to do that. Right now, that's not a great option because multi-targeting doesn't work well with the designer. So if you need to go in and use the, WF, the WPF designer to shift some UI elements or drop something in, you're not going to get to do that with this new project, or at least it may not always work well. Multi-targeting allows it to work occasionally, but you can't count on it. So you'll just be doing your UI updates in XAML. Um, the whole multi-targeting process, I think, is, is the way we're going to want to do this eventually, but I don't think that experience is there yet in the .NET Core 3 previews. So if we don't do that yet, then we're going to have two project files, assuming that we want to continue building for .NET Framework, since that's the thing that we can go live on now and that has the designer support. So we either can put the c -sharp project files next to each other in the same directory, or we put them in separate directories. If we put them next to each other in the same directory, that's going to make it easy to reference all the source and the XAML and the resources, because they're all going to be in the same places relatively. But that's going to introduce a challenge because these two CS project files are going to have the same default intermediate output and the same bin folders. So they're, they're going to get in each other's way when they're restoring packages, when they're building. So you're going to have to make some changes to actually have them use separate output folders. And unfortunately, there's actually a couple issues right now with publishing a .NET Core app when you've uh, changed the intermediate output folder, or at least a .NET Core WPF app. Uh, such that you need to clean, you do a .NET clean prior to running .NET publish. Totally something you can work around, but there's just some rough edges here, and it's going to be a little bit of a hassle. Now, again, this is a perfectly good option, but we're going to have to do a little bit of work to, to make it do what we want as far as just updating these output paths. So you might think, okay, well, you know, I'll avoid that by putting these in separate directories. So that's going to solve all the problems I just talked about, but now you're going to have a problem. The new .NET Core project file uh, format doesn't need to explicitly depend on C-sharp source, XAML pages, or uh, ResX files that are in its, in its directory or in uh, directories underneath its you know, directory. And if you're in a separate folder with your CS project, you don't get that benefit. You're going to have to explicitly reference all those things. Worse, because, you know, just adding those references isn't so bad. That's just like we used to do it with the old project file format. <laughs> Worse, there's currently some issues. Um, I can go out and um, show you this GitHub issue, where right now you have to explicitly link uh, those files. Um, you know, the automatic link generation isn't working. So in order for some XAML build processes, you actually need to add a link element to your pages so that they show up in the right relative path from your project files point of view. So you might say, I'm going to reference dot dot slash old project slash main window dot XAML. But you also need to add a link element to that saying that we link it to just main window dot XAML so that it doesn't see that um, directory traversal because that will, will mess up some of the WPF build steps. So again, that's totally solvable, not blocking at all, it just means if we go this route, there's a few extra steps we have to take. So eventually, a year from now, six months from now, whatever, we're just going to replace the old project file with a new one that multi-targets. Everything will be great. 
In the interim, we have to decide between these other two options, both of which have a couple of rough edges, but shouldn't be blocking. Um, so, you know, just heads up about that. So, um, for, for this demo, let's go ahead and create a new project, and we're going to actually use the uh, in the same directory approach because I know there have been some other videos recently where people put them in separate directories and so just for variety's sake let's see what this path looks like and um, we, you know, we'll go from there. So here we are in Visual Studio so we need to create a new .NET Core project. This could just be right click add new project but again I want to put it in the same folder and I don't want like the program.cs that gets auto generated all that stuff so I'm actually just going to create the CS project directly, and rather than create it by hand, which would be one option, I'm going to go to a temporary directory and I'm going to say .NET new WPF. This way, I get the um, template, and I don't have to remember what the SDK is called and stuff like that. Because you can see here's the contents of this auto-generated CS project file. It's got the nice Windows Desktop SDK. It's got that .NET Core app 3.0 is the target framework, win eggs the output, uses WPF true. This is what we want our project file to look like initially. So I'm going to come into VS Code, add a file, I'm going to call it bean trader client core or dot core dot CS project because I can't call it bean trader client dot CS project since that would conflict. And I'm just going to paste this in. All right, there we go. We've got a, a CS project file. Now, for a simple app, maybe a Hello World or something a little bit more complicated, we would be done. Because if I come over into Visual Studio and I add that project to my solution, what you're going to see, uh, let's see, come in here and add it. You'll see that we already have you know, all of the C-sharp sources referenced, my... Uh, ResX files are here. We've got uh, our XAML in the views folder because a lot of that stuff is automatically included by the new project file format. It automatically looks for those and includes them in the right way in the project. Uh, in a more complex project like this one, though, we're going to want to go through and, and actually look at the old CS project to see if there's anything else we have to change because there will be some things that will be a little bit different here that we want to make sure are done right in the new project file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to VS Code. I'm going to open both the old and the new project file. I'm going to put them side by side. And let's go ahead and look through the old project file to see which parts of it we need to bring over into the new project file. OK, so let's go through and see which of these properties and um, items we need in our new CS proj. So we've got these imports. We don't need this because we reference an SDK, and an SDK um, attribute on the project will imply that we're importing props and targets that are necessary to build this type of a project. So that takes care of sort of the standard uh, imports. So we skip over that. We do probably want root namespace and assembly name because if we add new files, we want them to use that namespace by default, and we want the app to build to be called Bean Trader Client, so it looks exactly like the old one, not Bean Trader Client Core, despite the different CS proj name. We don't need to auto-generate binding redirects, because .NET Core doesn't use binding redirects. Uh, I don't use these constants in my, in my project, but this reminds me that I do probably want to add a constant uh, because I find it's useful to define a constant indicating that we're building for .NET Core, so that if we have source shared between the .NET Framework and .NET Core projects, in some cases we may need to do one thing for .NET Core, one thing for .NET Framework if there's small API differences or something. So having this constant available makes it easy to use a pound if to, to do that. Um, there's an application icon, we need that, so we'll bring our uh, app icon over. And here's the uh, things that we're building. Most of these we won't need, like the application definition being, you know, including app.xaml, that's done by default. All C sharp files in or under this directory are compiled by default, so we skip those. XAML pages are uh, included by default, so we skip those. Here's a resource. Embedded resources are included, but resources are not, so we need an item group where we can add this resource. 
We also uh, have to add content, typically. Uh, well, I mean, some things will be added by, by default as content, but this one won't. This one's interesting, because look, it's a XAML file, but I'm adding it as content. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm using Ma Apps theming uh, to change like the color scheme or the accent of my app dynamically, and customers can choose which theme they want. But I'm actually loading some of the themes from disk so that we can have a style defined in XAML on disk, and then at runtime we load that dynamically and we use it as a theme. So that means that this XAML file does not need to be a page, but it should be content. So I'm actually going to copy it as content because actually, if I come over and look in Visual Studio, you will see that oops, that XAML page is right now included as a page because that's what happens by default. So instead, we're going to add it as content, and I'm actually going to remove it as a page. And I'm not only going to remo remove default accent XAML, I'm going to remove, I'm going to use a globbing pattern like you can with the new project files. I'm going to remove that file in any folder, not just the resources themes default. So that way, after we copy it to our output directory or to an intermediate output directory, we won't start uh, building it as a XAML page from there either. Okay, these ones are fine. Assemblyinfo.cs is an interesting one. It's included automatically, so that's good. But if we look at what assemblyinfo.cs is, it has a bunch of assembly attributes, and this was part of our new project template when we created the WPF app originally on .NET Framework. And it has these attributes for things like assembly title, copyright culture, and so on. And these assembly level attributes are auto-generated in .NET Core based on properties in your project file. So we actually can run into an issue here because these attributes will conflict with the auto-generated ones. Now, if this was a new project, it wouldn't be a problem because we wouldn't have assemblyinfo.cs. We would just set properties in our CS proj to define those values. But in this case, uh, it does become a problem. So I'm going to add a property called generate assembly info, and I will change that to false instead of its default true. And what that means is that we're not going to auto-generate those assembly level attributes, and therefore we'll just use this one instead. Uh, other things that might be interesting, the app config is included automatically, embedded resources are included automatically. Uh, resources are not, like I said, if we come over here and look, um, we can take a look at the images, and these images are um, con build type none, so they're in the none group. And in fact, I want them to be um, resources so that they're embedded in my assembly. So I need to add more resources here. But again, we can use that globbing pattern. So instead of adding each image in individually, I can add all PNG files anywhere under the directory the CS project is in. Or if I want to, I could say just under resources or resource images. You could scope it. But I'm going to include all the PNG files as resources. Finally, Remember I said in the last video that by switching our NuGet dependencies to use package reference um, syntax instead of using a packages.config file, that would make things easier later? Well, here's what it makes easier. It means that I can copy and just paste that item group, and this is going to work in uh, this, this CS proj the same as it, the same as it would have worked uh, previously, so we don't need to... Uh, make any changes here, we just pick up our NuGet references, we plop them down here, and we are good to go. So at this point, the CS proj file is essentially done. The only thing that's left to be done is to update the NuGet packages to the right versions or to change them if we need to change them. So I can come out to my command prompt here and do a .NET restore, and I have to specify which project since I have two CS proj files here now. I can do this from Visual Studio as well. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be done either from the Visual Studio IDE or from the command prompt. Both are great. It's just a matter of preference. So I'll sort of bounce back and forth so you can see both ways for a lot of the operations that I'm doing. In this case, I did a .NET restore. I get some warnings that there are packages that are targeting .NET Framework that I'm using instead of .NET Core. And remember, we talked about this previously. That's expected. This is the point where I'm going to need to update some of those. 
So there's different ways we can update them. Uh, one way is to do a .NET add, and then I specify the package that I'm adding to, and I then say package, and I need to give the, the name of the package. So I'll say maapps.metro, and this will update the maapps uh, reference to, oh, actually, it'll update it to the latest stable version, and in our case, we don't want the stable version. We want the one we found out on uh, on NuGet that supported .NET Core. So I will search for uh, apps.metro. Uh, it's this 2.0 alpha that we want. So I'll actually copy that version so I get the version right. We will add that. And so by doing a .NET add package, I'm now updating the package version that we're depending on to a more recent one, which supports .NET Core. Okay, if we come over to Visual Studio, we can do the same thing from here. If we go to Manage NuGet Packages, and see the ones that are installed. So we can take things like the Microsoft Azure Common. I know, see, it doesn't uh, the 2.0 version did not support .NET Standard or .NET Core, but the latest stable one does support that, so we're going to update. Say yes. We'll let that update. And then you can see here some of the other warnings. There's Microsoft Identity Model. Clients Active Directory did not target .NET, frame, or .NET Core, but the newer version does, so I update that one to 4.5.1 instead of version 2.29, and at this point, oh, and then the Neato Async is another one that um, has a pre-release that supports .NET Core, so I'm going to update from 4.01 to 5.00 pre-05, and that should be all of my packages that need to be updated. And again, in the first step, we went through and sort of understood what our packages were, so that we knew if we were going to have any issues. So we sort of know now what needs updated, and we can do those updates pretty quickly. Let's do one more .NET Restore. Ah, I have to save changes. When I make changes with the NuGet Package Manager here, it doesn't actually save the changes until uh, I hit that Save button. So now I'll do a .NET Restore. And I still have one warning. There's this Microsoft XAML Behaviors WPF. So what is that? I'm not depending on that directly. It must be a transitive dependency that comes in thanks to the closure of dependencies of things that I depend on at a top level. An easy way to find out how things are being pulled in is to go look in your object folder. There should be a file called project.assets.json. This is produced when you do a .NET restore, and it shows everything that's pulled in from NuGet, the libraries, the, the files, which packages they're part of, why those packages are referenced. So I can search for that Microsoft XAML behaviors. I see it is included because it's a dependency of the controls EX package. Controls EX, in turn, is included because it's a dependency of Ma Apps Metro. Okay, so this is interesting. My my project is depending on a NuGet package that targets .NET Framework instead of .NET Core. You remember I said that's not really what you want. It's okay, but it's it's not best. Uh, in this case, though, there's not a lot I can do about it because it's not a direct dependency. If I really wanted to use a different version of this Microsoft XAML Behaviors WPF uh, library, I could add a reference to a particular version of the NuGet package as a top-level dependency, and then everything would use that. But in this case, I don't think there even is a newer version. That's the latest version. So there's there's nothing to switch to. But because it's not a top-level dependency, it's it's more likely to be OK. Ma Apps Metro, with their version 2.0, has said this targets .NET Core. So they have a dependency, which depends on .NET Framework, but presumably when they targeted .NET Core, they test it on that platform, and they're saying, yeah, this works on .NET Core, it's safe to use. So I'm going to trust the owners of the packages I'm depending on directly and say if they're pulling in something transitively that targets .NET Framework, it's probably fine. Because again, many .NET Framework packages can be used, and this one probably is safe, at least in the ways that Ma Apps Metro and Controls EX are using it. Otherwise, they would have trouble targeting .NET Core. So this particular warning is probably safe, and we can consider our project file done at this point. Um, 
it looks a lot like our old project file, but way smaller. We, we automatically include a bunch of stuff. We make a few modifications with globbing patterns, and we've got our references to other packages or projects. And that's really all you need to do. And now we have two project files, one that targets .NET Framework, one that targets .NET Core. Next up, we're going to do a .NET build, and we're going to start going through build errors and that's going to be, now that's the ma the majority of the work in a migration effort. So that's probably going to be two videos. So I think coming up in videos three and four, we're going to be uh, doing the code level changes that we need to make this app work on .NET Core.